my fault, I take the blame for it. Uh, he, that's his profession, and he's an independent researcher known for his research and discoveries of Armenian historical documents, photos, monuments, and heritage sites. <coughs> Currently, he resides in Los Angeles. So, with no further, no further ado, please, Mr. Maurice Kalishan. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. After the recent Boston bombings, our President Barack Obama proudly proclaimed that if you want to know who we are, what America is, it's how we respond to evil. That is selflessly, compassionately, unafraid. Dear guests, what I'm going to present to you today is an early example on a grand scale of this American spirit that Obama highlighted only a few days ago. It is a forgotten chapter of American history, not just Armenian history, of an unprecedented humanitarian relief response to a, uh, to a tragedy that occurred thousands of miles away from our shores. By learning about America's response to the Armenian genocide, we will be learning, as Obama recently reminded us, what America is. The Armenian Genocide of 1915 mobilized the deep sympathy and just indignation of the American people. It wasn't the first time that the Americans had responded generously to the plight of the Armenians. During the aftermath of the Hamidian massacres of the 1890s and the Adena massacres in 1909, Americans responded in providing relief to the Armenians. Today, I'm here to express my utmost gratitude to the generous and selfless effort put forth by the Near East Relief to help hundreds of thousands of Armenians survive the genocide of 1915, as well as the tremendous support provided by the American government and its people who stopped at nothing to relentlessly campaign for the survival of the Armenian people. The Turkish Doctrine, January 13, 1915, New York Times, Christian in Great Peril, Interior Minister Talat Pasha declares, there is room only for Turks in Turkey. April 29, 1915, five days after April uh, 24, U.S. Ambassador Morgenthau intercedes reports great uneasiness over treatment of Armenians. This is one of the most important telegrams that how Near East Relief started. September 1915, a telegram from Ambassador Henry Mongertau to the Secretary of State. He says, destruction of Armenian race in Turkey is progressing rapidly. Massacres reported at Angora and Bursa. Will you suggest to Cleveland Dodge, Charles Crane, John Moth, Stephen Wise, and others to form committee to raise funds and provide means to save some of the Armenians? This is the actual telegram that Ambassador Morgenthau asked for a committee to raise funds and provide support. America to the rescue. Department of State, under leadership of James Barton and Cleveland Dodge, founded the American Committee for Armenian and Syrian Relief in 1915. This committee was com com compromised of American Board of Commissioners of Foreign Missions, which were already operating in Anatolia. The committee was mainly composed of multi-religious prominent Americans. The dawning of Near East Relief, volunteers, men and women, joined hands. In 1918, the Committee for the Ar Armenian and Syrian Relief was renamed and was now called the American Committee for Relief. Most probably, the Turks did not like the Armenian word right at the beginning. In 1919, by act of U.S. Congress, the committee's name was officially changed into Near East Relief. Critical lifeline. Between 1915 and 1930, Near East Relief provided assistance 
valued at $117 million, equivalent of $1.2 billion in today's dollars. Delivered food, clothing, and material for shelter by the shipload from the United States of America. You can read American Near East Relief, loaded camels, vessels moving from Pacific Coast to Constantinople by Near East Relief. Above all, they gave hope. Between 1915 and 1930, honorable, dedicated men and women armed with selflessness, compassion, faith, dedication, and determination to save hundreds of thousands of Americans from perishing. NER for short, during World War I, NER is credited with saving the lives of millions of Armenians, Arabs, Greeks, Assyrians, Persians, and other minorities in the region. Near East Relief was an act of philanthropy, which in the words of an American historian, Howard Zacker, Near East Relief quite literally kept an entire Armenian nation alive. I mean, getting kicked out of Turkey, slaughtered, killed, Everything robbed up with, with nothing left except orphans, lots of orphans. Near East Relief had logistical challenges. At one point between 1919 and 1920, an average of 333,000 people were fed daily. That is easier said than done. 40 hospitals were built, over 132,556 Armenian children were housed, fed, provided with medical care, and taught in orphanages across the region. As the number of children residing in the orphanages and foster homes grew, Near East Relief workers' focus shifted to teaching the kids vocational skills like agriculture, farming, training, the blind, industrial skills, masonry, mechanics, shoemaking, shipbuilding, bakery, carpentry, tailoring, nursing, barbering. Thus, Near East Relief mission went beyond relief. A benchmark international sustainable economic development organization. NER's approach created the models for the Marshall Plan, Truman's Point Four program, the US Peace Corps, USAID, United Nations Development Program, UNDP were all created based on Near East Relief activities. Grass movement in the U.S. to support the Armenians. Multi-religious sermons emphasized the alarming situation for Armenians in Anatolia. Nationwide fundraising posters campaigns are mobilized. This drive was later spread to Europe. Clear your plate. Remember the starving Armenians becomes a daily American household slogan. Probably today's senators and congressmen, when they were kids or their parents were, they were taught these sentences because it was a daily American household slogan. Bundle, bundle days all over the U.S., different states, encourage people to send used clothing overseas, which they did by the million tons. The, by the million tons. Americans become the change. Americans were urged to adopt an orphan. $60 a year cares for a child. On International Golden Rule Sunday, families across the country ate simple orphanage meal and donated the equivalent to the cost of their average Sunday dinner to near East Relief to, lay, to raise funds. U.S. President Calvin Coolidge, Woodrow Wilson issued proclamations and wrote endorsement letters in support of fundraising drives. Celebrities like Jackie Coogan, child star actor Jackie Coogan, who played an orphan in Charlie Chaplin's 1921 silent movie The Kid, was commissioned by the Near East Relief Foundation in 1924 to embark on what became to be known as the world's first celebrity humanitarian fundraising campaign. Reese Athens is actually looking at a Near East Relief map showing orphanages across all the way from Istanbul to Greece to Armenia, Russian Armenia, Western Armenia, Syria, Lebanon, and all. 
You might know, you might not know who Jackie Coogan is, but he later played his role in Uncle Fester <laughs> the, in the Adams Family. All 50 U.S. states had Near East offices. We sometimes push for the G word to congressmen and senators. Maybe we should tell them that your parents collected food, you know, raised funds for what at that time? Becoming foster parents for the orphans whose parents were systematically killed. This is in Bakuba, Iraq. 850 orphans. Let the poster speak. This is milk week for Near East Relief. A can of condensed milk, as you saw in the, in the movie, the, the, the kids were throwing uh, cans of milk into the truck. Poster campaign highlighting Armenians. You can't let us starve. Your bit saves us live. Armenian and Syrian Relief. New York City. Two and a half million starving. Save a life. This stamp buys a meal for a starving Armenian child near East Relief. And lots of pins, whoever donated, they would get these pins. Children like Shushan need food, clothing, and shelter. Starving, help now. As you can see, this poster, which is also displayed here in the museum, it's a campaign for 30 million, to raise 30 million dollars. You would think this is just an artistic drawing, but merely a reflection of reality, because I was able to locate where the artist took this photo from. The real raped Armenian mother was really there. Look at the details. I mean, the headscarf, the baby in the back, Everything is the same. And this is a Near East Relief number 207 picture. It's reading Armenian woman. Actual photo of the Armenian survivor and her child in despair. And this is the new Near East magazine in 1921 where it says this sad Armenian mother with her baby, the progeny of an enemy race, is depending as are others on us Americans. The child at your door, save the survivors. More pictures of posters, and this is an original one right here. This is an original poster. Lest we perish. They shall not perish. Do your part when you are asked to give. American Committee of Relief in the Near East. 8,000 panels carried this poster across the country in 1925, contributed by the Outdoor Advertisement Association of America with no expense to Golden Rule funds. What was very important from day one when Near East Relief was created, that there were no expenses. For example, if you donate currently, uh, let's say, to American Red Cross, I think for operation, overhead operation, they, they, uh, they spend like 30 or 40 percent of that amount before they can get the shipments out of the way. So in Near East Relief, uh, you know, Cleveland Dodge was paying for all the shipping expenses. So whatever money was collected, 100 percent was going to, to re relief. Painted and illuminated signs, uh, signs donated in Detroit to Golden Rule campaign. In 1925, again, hundreds of thousands of copies of this poster in various sizes were distributed throughout the United States. The interesting part is Uncle Sam, and in the background, you see Ararat. So they were really involved, and this is the original picture. Uncle Sam protecting Armenian orphans on the plains of Ararat with ruined churches in the background. This is a really, rare, very rare postcard. Skull, bloody sword, death, 
hunger, wolves, and the Near East Relief Star. I painted it in yellow just to hide that highlight so you can see it. Hope for the Armenians. Remember, from West Armenia, every you know whoever could pass to East Armenia, Russian Armenia, which was under you know tremendous pressure after Russia falling apart and, and the Bolsheviks started. So there was tremendous hunger in Armenia. <clears throat> so not only whoever was dead, but the survivor needed food, and the only hope was through Near East Relief. Arshalus Aurora Mardiganian, born in the city of Chemskezek near Kharper, present-day Turkish province of Elazig, the daughter of an Armenian wealthy financier, right here, a true survivor. In 1915, when Aurora was 14 years old, she witnessed the murder of her father, mother, brothers, sisters. She was taken to the harems of a number of Turkish pashas, and despite the fact that she was repeatedly, repeatedly tortured, she had remained true to her Christian faith. She found refuge with an American Near East doctor, Frederick McCollum, who safely returned her to Erzurum, which by then was under Russian control. Through the mediation of General Antranik via Tbilisi, Georgia, she was sent to USA for medical care as well as to bear witness to the suffering of the Armenians in the Ottoman Empire to her personal experience. She was brought in here next door to the Ar Ar Ararat uh, uh, home and she passed away across the street to the Holy Cross uh, Church and one of the ladies here, she was one of the few who saw her uh, last. This story of, and the important thing is that her story was uh, turned into a film, which is unfortunately lost, and there's only 20 minutes of it. This story of Aurora Mardiganian, the most amazing narrative ever written, has been reproduced for the American Committee for Armenian and Syrian Relief in a tremendous motion picture spectacle, Ravished Armenia. Those who are privileged to see it will also respond to the National Near East, Repeal, uh, Near East Relief Appeal to save a life. So funds were raised because of that film. Ravished Armenia story, you see, you see the poster where the Turk is holding a bloody sword and, and supposedly this is uh, Arshalus Madiganyan. The film was named Ravished Armenia and some other places was uh, called Auction of Souls and it was being shown in different places in New York City, uh, in, in, in Los Angeles, also in London and also in French. There is, there is a French version of this movie as well. And there, it is most, uh, you know, one of the most sought movie out there. Here's some pictures taken and this is Aurora or Arshavis right here. You know, real Turkish soldiers, caravans of deportation. It was, I could say, is the, the first genocide, Armenian genocide related film. And these are posters to show where the film was playing. Only 20 minutes of this film footage has survived, available on YouTube. If you do, in you know, Ravished Armenia, you can see it. Anthony Slide wrote a book about Ravished Ar Armenia and was able to, to collect all the photos from the movie uh, companies. Here are rare personal pictures of Aurora Mardiganian in 1929, in 1933. Thank you, Maggie, again for providing these photos well, when she got married. In 1919, and just before she passed, her last picture. Mm -hmm. What year is that? Uh, 1994. Posters of bundle station, leave a bundle of old clothes here, save a life next winter in the Near East. Remember, we see a lot of pictures, genocide pictures, where the bodies are nude. The Turks would make them take off their clothes because it was a rare commodity, commodity there. That. San Francisco contributes to 3,820,000 pounds of old clothes donated by the American people to the Near East Relief in 1923. Judge Curtis Wilbur, who became Secretary of Navy then. 
Michigan's answer to the Armenians, 12 carloads of clothing in Armenian is right here written. Even the Canadians, Western Canada's gift flower to starving Armenian kiddies. And they, they traveled all the way from Western Canada all the way to New Orleans and it says each car bore the poster shown in the picture and the railroad officials agreed that the poster shall remain on the cars until it reached New Orleans port so that it was loaded on ships to be shipped to, you know, Turkey. An invitation, the Industrial Committee of the Near East Relief announces an exhibit and sale of Near East Relief import importations, the handiwork of our uh, orphanage schools and refugee centers in the Transcaucasian, Syria, Palestine, and Greece. Handkerchiefs, embroideries, laces, rugs, scarves. Uh, Henry Mangantau as the chairman. February 28, 1924 in New York. Laces and anywhere. This is the Near East Relief area of operation. And each star that you see is an orphanage, full orphanage working. You can see in Co near Constantinople, Derinje, Adabazar, and Bardizag or, or Brusa, a lot of stars. And another concentration is Kharper. But interesting here is they have included the Wilsonian Armenia map here, which gave 400 kilometers on the, on the Black Sea, and the Soviet Armenia here, so it's specified. And again, it went all the way to Baghdad, to, uh, you know, Abadan, Mosul. What's the date of this map? Uh, what's the date on? Of the map? Uh, I think 1925. But the map changed. I'll go back just so you can see. You can see the operation all over here. The map is prior to 1922 because that's when they were kicked out. After this, uh, the Smyrna, after the Smyrna in 1922 disaster, Christians were evicted by the Kemalist Turkey. Massive issues for Near East Relief to move all these folks who were here to the outside, to Greece, to Syria, uh, Lebanon, Jerusalem, and obviously Gyumri and in Armenia and northern Persia. New orphanages started coming up. New orphanage at Beirut opened under auspices of Near East Relief, uh, 1922, an alliance between the United States and Australasian for relief work was signalized by the opening today of an Australasian or orphanage for 1,200 Armenian refugee children, the institution located on the seashore of Antilias. Suburb of uh, Beirut is part of the orphanage system of the American New East Relief. The director is Mr. Knudsen of Christ Church, Christ Church, New Zealand, assisted by Ms. Mrs. Knudsen and Ms. Hilda King of Melbourne, Australia. Today, that location is the Antilas Orphanage that became the headquarters of the Armenian Catholic Assad of the Great House of Silesia. But unfortunately, they do not know. They know that it was an orphanage, but they don't know that it was an Australian orphanage. In Adelaide, Australia, collecting money, compassion is not limited by distance. Even Australia from 8,825 miles between Beirut and Australia away responded to the calls of the Armenian survivors. It is mind-boggling. How many Armenians do we see today trying to go and help other nations or people who are going to rough times? Here it is, a picture. Australian flower, a flower for starving Armenian children. Near East Reef was not just an American organization, and the International Federation operation included Australia, New Zealand, Japan, Philippine Island, Korea, Hawaii. This is when they arrived at Antilias. The kids are building their own barracks. They're sleeping in the tents here. This is in Antilias. Antilias barracks. If every nail was driven and every board was laid by the orphans. They built their own houses. 
a group of orphans. After that comes the clean clothes, Reverend Jesse Cresswell and Miss Gordon hand the bundles to the various recipients. <coughs> Under the Australian flag. I had this picture for over six years, trying to figure out where is this, until I met a, fr a good friend of mine from Australia, who was researching in Australian archives, became Bakkenian, and when I sent him this picture, he cried over Skype. And he was spending another four or five years researching, trying to find any visual stuff. They are laying plates under the protection of the Australian flag. I was fortunate enough, Nelly Miller's son in Arizona, I got hold of him, and he shared a you know, lot of uh, photos that this is probably the first time you're seeing, and it, it is in the Orphans of Genocide booklet as well. Earlier we saw the, the flower ship being sent from Australia. It's being unloaded in Antilias. Mass Baptist in the Antilias River. Next to the Antilias there's a river. It, it is still flows today. Spirits are kept high through physical education in 1926. The banner reads, Near East Relief Antilias Trade School Band, 1926 Band. And this is Mr. Major Knudsen, who's from Christchurch. July 1929, Galoligos Sahak II, Habayan of Holy See of Silesia, formally asked Barclay Akison, overseas director of Near East Relief, to transform the Antilias Orphanage into a theological seminary. The orphan barracks, becomes the first church of the Armenian Catholic of Great House of Salvation. April 1934, during their annual meeting, the Near East Board of Trustees voted to sell the property to Near East Foundation. For $22,000, the property was sold to Armenian church for $19,000. The sum was donated by an Egyptian Armenian couple, Mrs. and Miss, Mrs. Simon Matilda Kaikajian, the Near East Foundation itself con contributed 3000 towards the purchase price. This is an aerial photo in 1960, shot on Antilias Catalogas build building. It's right at the seashore, and this is where the river is where they were baptized, the, the kids, earlier. Obviously, all these trees are gone now, there's buildings. And this is Easter celebration just a few weeks back in Antilias, the same location of that orphanage. We've heard of bird's nest in, in Biblos or in Jebel. Where did that name come from? It is here where Maria Jacobson had candies in her hand. She's giving candies to the children and the children are around her, you know, screaming for who's going to get the candy. And she thought that she was mother bird feeding the little birdies and that's what, how the bird's nest came. And this is bird's nest in Saida, which is in South Lebanon, or Saida in Arabic, before it went to Jubei. Merry Christmas to their American friends from the birdies of bird's nest, Saida, and Heidi, the village camel. <laughs> this is a very important picture. Saida orphanage tricycles, courtesy of Antilia's orphanage carpenters boys. The younger boys do learn carpentry, make tricycles, and send them to Sidon so the other kids can play with. And my cousin's father was one of those carpenters. And he was alive and I, I didn't, I wasn't involved in that stuff and I missed that opportunity. This is Bird's Nest in Sidon in 1925. Over 400 toddlers. Maria Jacobson was a professional nurse she started from Harpert, she came to Lebanon, and she was expert, her expertise was in, in taking care of little children, toddlers. This is a Druze uh, landlord who, he, who lost money in World War I, and he just wanted, needed money. He rented this palace.
to Maria Jacobson and Neil East Relief to take care of those 400 children. Take a look, good look at this picture, okay? What you see here, they're laying plates here because they're going to sit for dinner or for lunch. This is the entrance and these are the arches and the columns, okay? Take a good look. It took me four months driving to Sidon, Beirut, Sidon, when, you know, where is this? I have the notes of, uh, you know, Nelly Miller, the guy from Arizona, describing the hills and this, things have changed. And I found this, if I missed it by one second, I wouldn't have found it because I was trying to give away uh, and, uh, you know, that I can't find it. It was, it's all barricaded and you can't see it. That's why I couldn't find it. And this is at the same location where the kiddies were. If you see the columns, in 1925 it moved to Biblos, north of Lebanon, or Jebel. And it used to be an American orphanage, and now the Danish took over, the KMA, which is, uh, yeah, you know, and, uh, from Sidon to Biblos. Mama, as she was called, Maria Jacobson, and, and her birdies. 1928 birdies praying. Yeah. Look at this picture. Maria is teaching them Bible study. Look at the eyes of the kids. God knows what each child, what kind of traumatic story they had. And this is the hope they're getting to change their life. Regular medical checkups. We got a lot of pictures, so I'm going to be going quickly, okay? 1954, Maria Jacobson received the gold medal of honor awarded by the Lebanese government. There are any Lebanese in there? Is Ramon Edde sitting here? And the U.S. Ambassador and Maria Jacobson. And Karakin first. Maria Jacobson, as mama, 57 years of passion, compassion, and dedication to save and empower Armenian children. Arrived at 1907 Har Harput as a nurse for delivering babies, and she passed away in 1960 in Biblos. Her biggest task during her last Christmas season was writing over 600 letters, quite a, challenging in her old, a challenge in her old age asking for donations from friends of the business all over the world. Selfless devotion. In June 1917, when American, America entered World War I, American uh, Near East employees were compelled to leave Turkey. Maria Jacob Jacobson, as a Danish, volunteered to stay and run the American hospital in Turkey. She took care of children who were totally cut off from the rest of the world. 1919, the Near East Relief re returned to the area with 20 trucks loaded and packed with all kinds of food, provisions, and clothing to be distributed among the children because 1918, the World, was, World War I was over. By then, Maria Jacobson was caring for, for and administering the provisions of over 3,600 orphans. I have three kids and I can't handle them. <laughs> 3,600, most of whom were hidden by Armenian widows among ruined houses in Kharper and cemeteries scattered through the area. This is where she passed away, where she buried. She wanted, her wish was to be buried in, next to her birdies. Until today, Birds Nest Orphanage is still in operation, although uh, you know, for divorced parents and stuff like that. Take a good look at this. Mar Machai refugee camp. When they arrived, they were in tents. Look at this. The following picture you'll see a few days later, few few years later. And see how their houses now? Although it's wooden houses and tents, but this is, and now they're all kind of buildings. There's bus stations and. and uh, Danish Mission Clinic in camps, uprooted from their beautiful homeland, 
with lots of servants, horses, and everything to end up in misery like these. Look, I mean, look at this small house or this mother who is living. And this shack, wooden shack, you know what these shingles are? These are tanks, like oil tanks, that they open them flat so they can use them as shingles. Wash day, misery everywhere. Look at where they walk. No shoes. She's carrying her sister or, or brother probably. Holding the balconies with wood. Soup kitchens. But Neely Sri brought back smiles. Kids started smiling again. The Near East version of the famous children's story, Alice in Wonderland. This is a second film which is lost. It was called Alice in Hungerland. Alice was an orphan. 12-year-old orphan in this orphanage, right here, on this picture. Twelve-year-old orphan saved from starvation in Turkey by the Near East Reef and cared for in one of the orphanages in Constantinople, and Mrs. Florence Spencer Drea of New York National Director has adopted Alice. The continuous outpour of compassion and generosity of the American society. The ad of the movie in Washington Post, December 1921. A little brochure, Alice in Hungerland and how she got there. A real movie in three reels. This is a picture. Alice seen in this image as an example of what Near East Relief are accomplishing. This is the second movie after Auction of Souls or Ravished Armenia, which is lost. Here is Alice herself in Armenia feeding Armenian children. Alice shown in the movie feeding the hungry, obviously with the white dress. She's alive. She turned 100 last year. <coughs> Does she recall any of her Armenianness, or has because she was adopted by an American? Can I continue, and then we'll have answers, uh, question and answer, please, so that I'll, I'll keep. Please take me in. Hundreds of thousands of children were asking just to get inside orphanages. Orphanages were flooded. They were not feeding them enough food. They were just feeding them because there was so much orphans, so many orphans, so that they can just keep them going and not feed them fully. The silent genocide, the Antura Orphanage. Article 2, Section E, United Nations Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide specifies forcibly transferring children of the group to another group is an act of genocide. No sword, no blood, just transferring children from one group to another is genocide. The forceful Turkification of Armenian children between the ages 3 and 16 was being carried out in Antura, Lebanon between 1915 and 18. This is Stanley Kerr's book, Jamal Pasha and Halide Edip, standing in front of Antura step. This was the picture that in 2005, I wanted to see where Jamal Pasha stood and unraveled this Antura, uh, you know, Turkification process. There was some history, there was some vague history about it, but I was able to, to find all the pictures that you're going to see and all the uh, archival documents uh, found there. Methods of Turkification. Armenian boys were circumcised, Armenian names were changed into Turkish names, Whoever prayed in Armenian or said any Armenian word, their souls were, you know, with falakha, bastinados hitting under their souls. Kids, three, four, five, six years old, some of them who, who didn't even speak Turkish, but they didn't know every time they spoke they were beaten. Trained to become Turkish Ottoman soldiers right here. Forced to forget everything about their cultural identity. Forced to embrace and practice the Turkish culture. 
Every day at sunset, Armenian children praising Jamal Pasha. Turkey fight Armenian children at Antura College entrance. Look at this. Turkish flowers, I mean flags, they have flowers in here. They wanted to portray to the world that they are doing something good by Turkifying children. And this holiday did. The famous entity, our famous NASA, has a star in her name. You check it out. There is a holiday, a deep star up in the universe in her name because she was a famous lady. She, was the ki she watched the kids from the tower being beaten under their souls. She was the one who wrote to Talat Pasha asking to return Gomidas back. Gomidas is right here, his face right here. She was the one who asked Talat to return, and he did return. Obviously, he was not in a normal uh, you know, uh, position, and he lost his mind and all that. But you know why she wanted to return him? In, in her 1926 book, she says, when Gomidas went and collected over 3,000 you know, music and songs, and you know, uh, you know, when they were baking, lady, Armenian ladies were baking uh, their bread, and, and, and the farmers were you know, sowing the, 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 uh, the fields, they were singing songs. He collected those songs, and, and, and you know, we, we got about 1,800 of them from the villages. She said, those were, it's in the book in 1926, she said those were Turkish songs that Gomidas. In fact, Gomidas was a Turk, but he didn't know it. And we have, in NASA, gave her a star in her name. Ottoman archives of the Prime Minister from Jamal Pasha, writing to Talat Pasha, this is uh, July 1918, I'm, I'm working on the exact date, but July 1918. I demand 31,000 liras for the children of immigrants in the Antura orphanage. There are Armenian orphans who were converted to Islam and the sick children of Turkish immigrants who were sent to an from Anatolia. This orphanage should be administered as a perfect Turkish institution and also, it should be administered with the budget provided by the center. <coughs> Reverend Eskijian's orphans, some of them were collected by Swiss missionary, uh, I forgot her name right now, but I'll, I'll remember. And Jamal Pasha, 70 of her orphans, he brought them to Antura. So there is a connection with this museum in memory of Uri Reskijian, the Antura orphans, Sister Romer, Swiss missionary. And she said, why are you taking my orphans away? Jamal answered that because they're all wearing nice clothes, they're clean, they're not sick, they're bright. So we're taking it. Even that they didn't want to spend to save the orphans who were like in bad shape. They just want everything ready. After the defeat of the Turks by the Allied for forces in World War I, 1918, NER takes over the Antura orphanage for a short period of time. The orphans get back their Armenian names. They are encouraged to remember their old names. This is Bertha Morley of Near East Sunif and Major Stephen Trowbridge of the American Red Cross first meeting the Antura orphans. Ghazir bears the orphanage. I'm jumping from one orphanage to another with, with data. Empowering the children to become independent, dedication beyond relief work, in order to prevent Armenian girls ending up working as maids in houses and endangering their, their you know, livelihood, and to help them become self-sufficient in their lives beyond the orphanage. When they were 16 years old, Papa Kunstler, Swiss missionary, working for the Near East Relief, established a rug factory in Ghazir. Over 3,240 rugs were produced from Ghazir. The, cre the creation of one very special rug. This is the orphanage today. It's a building where a lot of, uh, you know, 
uh, all these grasses green, but at that time when I took it, it wasn't. Uh, they do marriage ceremonies and parties in this house right now. Mrs. and Mr. Kunstler. This is the actual orphanage, 1,400 girls. There were 12 orphanages in Ghazi. This is one of them. You see the arches? And there's a water fountain right here. Okay? This is where it is now. The arches and the water fountain. At work at the rock factory in Ghazir. Maximum empowerment. An orphan without hands using her feet to repair wool threads for the carpet. A carpet as a thank you for the American government and the president. This is just for the White House. This is the carpet before being shipped to, the, uh, to Washington. And these are the girls working at the rug factory. New York Times headlines, Presidents receive rug woven by orphans of Near East Relief and praises work relief. U.S. President Calvin Coolidge and Dr. Finley of Near East Relief on the Ghazir carpet at the White House. Only three years, I mean, they came to Ghazir after 1922 September, right? And this is 1925. Now, at the end of 1922, they arrived into Ghazir. They started the rag factory, they started learning and all this. Only three years later, they donated a carpet to the White House. They wove their love into that carpet to say thank you for looking after us. This is the Washington Post in 1925. It says here, Coolidge received two Armenian girls who work on the carpet. And one of them is Bartuhi, which, which would be Bartuhi. 15 year old who work on the rug with over 1 million knots and you know this is the rug in the White House it still exists today it used to be in the display it's in, in, in one of the warehouses they take it out once a year for cleaning and making sure everything is okay details of the rug size material source etc as shown on it in golden rule, gratitude to President Coolidge. Made by the Armenian girls in Ghazir, Syria, because at that time there was no Lebanon, it was Syria, orphanage in the Near East Relief. This is Vartuhi after 60 years in Washington, sitting on the carpet that she wore. Jakob Gunzler, a sample of several Swiss Armenian friendship committees converting refugee camps into modern. These are the shacks, the houses. They were building one room houses. And some of them exist today, by the way. Another Mr. Weiser, Swiss national representative in charge of the Ghazir Orphanage for the Blind, where classes of Braille were taught. And this is where where the orphanage shop was for the blind, where they did products, wove products on, you know, with uh, bamboo. And this is where it looks, it's a supermarket right now. The same building. Dr. Harutu Sarabian, born in Harpert, deported from Rasulain to Derzor. He got away. He graduated from American University of Beirut, AUB, in 1923. Dentist for thousands of orphans, zealous for mount cleaning. In order to encourage them, every six months, they would do a competition who's, who had the cleanest teeth in the orphanage. And every six months, they will gain this. Okay? A clean tooth never decays. Developed an inter-orphanage mount cleaning contest. Carpenter. The contest was performed every six months. We said that. Whoever had dirty mouths, they would label them head on a, you know, that brushing, brushing, that this, wash, all that. 
The winner was Myreni. Her name is Myreni. I'll try. No hands. She's the same. She has no hands. She's the she's the same girl earlier I showed you where she was weaving, weaving with her feet. No hands. With her feet. Don't try it at home. And this is another carpet that I have witnessed and I missed in buying it. American Near East Relief Inter-Orphanage Mod Cleaning Contest. The, the earlier one was, you know, changed to a proper carpet. Look at this. A clean tooth never decays, the same one we read. Saidan Razir Jubail Antilias. And the NER star. And the American Dental Association. There is, you know, it, it's in Nasser now. They, they gave it to American Dental Association. It's in Boston uh, in the... This is a carpet, okay, in 1925. And you can see, here was the contest. Who won in, in July 25, 26, uh, 25 again? So you can see Saeed and Burznes, Antilias, Saeed and Burznes, Razir, whatever. A red collection of official Near East relief pictures bearing the near uh, NER star logo. And it's all written here, okay? I've typed it so I can read it faster. Rescued girls in near an ER home. <coughs> now imagine every girl which is rescued there and saved and build a family in the future. Probably our grandparents. Group of girls rescued from harems, rescued from the Turks Aleppo. Sari Kamish, barefoot in the snow. A ward in one of the 36 hospitals. A blind Armenian mother with her children. Armenian mother with the corpse of her five children. And this is a cleaner picture. Now that is a Near East Relief one. Okay. Unconscionable suffering expressed in one picture. Kid, one on the back, one in her hand, and no husband. Kids were, it was a common thing to be left on the streets. And it became, look, there are people going into their business. But these are Armenians, it's, you know, it's happening, genocide, they're, they're cockroaches, they're, there's just normal stuff going on, nothing, you know. Women were taken away and violated in front of their family members. People watched while Armenian children found infected. Men were killed. You know that picture. This is a Near East Relief. Look at that. These are children, right? No father, no mother. Don't know what to do. Don't know where to go. No food. Where are the parents? Turkey, tell me, where are the parents? How come there are thousands of orphans? Where are the husbands? Why are they not in this picture? Tiny and half, de half dead. Living ghosts. Look at this one. This is Ar Armenia. In the backyard of Hmianzin. These are the, the orphans that they were able to run from Van and come here. Armenian nurses. But it became a common thing happening. Smyrnia. Camelus came on this army entering Smyrnia. The Great Fire of Smyrna, the fire that ravaged Smyrna in September 1922 and lasted for four days. It occurred shortly after the Turkish army regained control of the city on 9 September. The reason I'm bringing Smyrna here is because after this date, all the Christians were under Kemalist Turkey, Turkey were kicked out of uh, Turkey. Major Dopian produces countless eyewitnesses, include French soldiers stationed at the consulate who had claimed to have seen people in Turkish uniform start fires. Approximately 300,000 people caught in the quay. The fires were burning from the back, the waterfront, the quay was there, so people were pushed, the Turks were coming in the back, and they were stuck while these are American, French, and British ships were, were there, but did not want to interfere while this was going on burning for four days. Eventually, an American Navy ship 
went in and started taking. Look at the quay, how the buildings are all burned. Smyrna, wall of humanity, portion of the 300 people caught. This is all Library of Congress. People didn't know how to swim either. Or even the ones who knew, who went to the ships, they were throwing hot water on them so that they can climb on the, the ships. This is a postcard where it shows Armenian quarter. Okay? Look at, look at the hill here, the background. Okay? Guess which were the Armenian houses? See the hill? All these burned ones are the Armenian houses. The ones standing are the Turk houses that didn't burn. I'll go back. Look how it was. Okay? Evicted by the Camelot's Turkey, new area of Near East relief operation. A nightmare, logistical nightmare to move all these kids, all these supplies, everything. It's easier said than done. Here, deported, deported Armenian children. Where are their parents? Saying farewell to Turkey and glad to do it. Sometimes we say, you know, they didn't stay there, they moved them out, we blame them and this, but at least they survived. Taken into barges, into the larger ships. This is in, in Constantinople. Here you can read, in, if you can read, it's a Near East Relief. These are, these are the depots where all the ships will bring. So they're, they're, you know, Armenian and Greek orphans are loaded into barges. Armenian orphans at the Acropolis in Athens. They got moved from Smyrna to, to Athens. Orphans at the Temple of Jupiter in Athens. Even Ambassador Morgenthau, after you know he left as a as, as a U.S. ambassador from Turkey, went to the U.S. and then he came back to Greece. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was the one who talked with Amber, with Talat, and I wonder what he was wondering, thinking at that time, seeing all these orphans. And it was his telegram that I read, which made the Near East relief. As they were taking kids out, he moved uh, uh, Papa Kunzler, the Swiss missionary that you saw earlier, he moved 8,000 kids on donkeys and mules to Syria and Lebanon, a 513 mile trip. Entrusted the children to Papa Jack Jakob Kunzler as he knew the territory well, as well as Kurds and Turks would not harm the kids when Jakob Kunzler was with them as he has cured and saved the life of many Turks and Kurds in his clinic. Earlier. International Near East Association representing 14 countries met in Switzerland in 1923. Australia, Belgium, Canada, China, Cuba, Czechoslovakia, Denmark, France, Greece, Armenia, Germany, UK, Japan, Korea, Philippines, Sweden, Switzerland, and United States. A coalition of countries who pitched in to help. And these are all their addresses. Humanity is universal. It does not have a religious boundary. While Turks and Kurds had declared jihad against Armenians, the king of the Arab lands and Sharif of Mecca, Hussein bin Ali, the highest spiritual authority of Islam, direct descendant of the Prophet Muhammad and guardian of its holiest places, issues a decree making Armenians a protected people of Islam. The call for the protection during the Armenian Genocide was only a reflection of the true values of Islam and its relationship with their Christian neighbors. This is the decree on the right. Arab help in Syria. League of Nations protection of women and children in the Near East. This Danish missionary Karen Yepe. This is Hashem Pasha. And this is Misak Melkonian. This is Mahjem Pasha. Both Pashas helped to free imprisoned Armenian women and children from Turks, Kurds, and Bedouins. A common sight among the Armenian refugees in Syria, an Armenian child dead in the fields within sights of help in safety at Aleppo. 
the League of Nations car, which was crisscrossing the desert in search of Armenian kids. One of the freed Armenian one, uh, women, tattooed by Bedouins, saved from harems and slavery, rescued Armenian children and the car. Miss Karen Yepe looking for orphans on camel. Let the desert tell the story. Again, where are the parents? Learning Armenian traditions again. Karen Yepe. Look at the laces, the carpets, the handkerchiefs and whatever. She was even encouraging to send priests and she would put you know men and women together and say go find your mates and get married she would order them to do that to make families this is the marriage ceremony Miss Yepe also like Maria Jacobson wanted to be buried with her people in Aleppo and this is her cemetery mm -hmm. Armenian black girls with Mary Lowell in Jerusalem under the British Lord Mayer's Refugee Fund in England, 1917. This is very important because this was done in 1917 by the British. 1,200,000 deported and their, and their homes destroyed by the Turks and Kurds. Look at the number. Help us to save the remnant of this brave and persecuted people. Armenian orphans in Mesopotamia. Bakuba, Iraq, where 17,000 Armenian orphans were found. British hospitality. 850 orphans. Near East Relief Telegram by the president of Armenian, Aharonian. More than 200,000 refugees dying between Gaza and Alexandropol. Lack of food, fuel. We beg you, take step immediately for continuation shipment and provisions by America. In Gumiri. Largest orphanage in the world, Alexandra Bol, Armenia. It went 18, 22, 25, 28. It reached 30,000 orphans. <coughs> Providing needs, a logical nightmare, logistics nightmare. Each one had to eat, to wear, to bath, to comb. A single day's flour supply. Men pushing the uh, train with, with the loaded uh, flour. Feeding folks at, you know, Alexandra Ball. Dining room girls, each cuts 2,000 portion of bread for every meal. These, these are not pails, fire, you know, uh, buckets. They are soup buckets because they have to go and, and there are so many to, to fill the buckets. And here, leader Davidian Mariam estimates the number of meals needed every year at the Kazaji post. These many, four million meals were needed. A lunch table over a mile long. But the luckiest one were inside the orphanages. Children waiting in the snow for admission in the orphan city. A daily scene from early morning until late night. This is in Gumri, Alexandra Bol, Armenia. No compromise on cleanliness, chasing away epidemics. So many children next to each other, epidemics, it's a, it's a Dr. Carpenter, Typhus quarantine group. This is the quarantine area away from the children. The super lady who was in, in Smyrnia, the American woman's, from the American woman's hospital, Dr. Mabel Elliott ran world's largest medical station in Gumri. 30,000? That's her. Where are the parents? It's a church service. The priest is here, and look at the children are. Near East Reef orphans at Alexandra Bull expressing their sentiments in the proper way. These are children. They are lined in such a way to say, America, we thank you. And all these Russian barracks, Tsar's barracks, which were given for free for Near East Reef, 
they were used, there was about 30 of them, and uh, surprisingly enough, as Americans, they continued to provide this help in, in Armenia until 1926, although the, the, the Bolsheviks in 1917 revolution and, and the communists later on. So they stayed until then. It is really started teaching people skills that could permanently improve their lives. The idea is expressed in the following proverb. Give a man a fish, and he will eat for a day. Teach him how to fish, and he will eat for a lifetime. This was Nerius Reeves' action plan. Bookbinding, teaching bookbinding, sewing, shoemaking, mechanics, nursing, reknitting the feet of winter stockings, patching their own clothes, tailoring. American farming methods are revolutionizing agricultural cultivation in the Caucasus. Many tractors and other modern implements have been introduced into the country for the first time. Driver and boy are both orphan refugees. And American companies have provided those tractors. By the way. Teaching folks to feed themselves. How they arrived and how they became. Armenian make, Armenians making 2,500 quilts, crowded beds full of children. This is the same map out of Turkey, okay? These are children, 4,200 of them <coughs> lined up to make Near East Relief and the map Greece, Cyprus, I mean, uh, Cyprus, Lebanon, Syria, and Armenia where the kids are. As far as you can see, Orphans, orphans, orphans. Again, where are the parents? These are the barracks where they stayed, how they look now in, in Gyumri. Some of them are falling apart. But something interesting. Even after communists for 70 years, the start of Nilis Relief is still there. And you can read 19... 22. One of the orphans graduated from there, he got well, he came back, he took one of the orphanages, he rebuilt it, it's operating right in Armenia. Turchinian Home is a privately funded orphanage in Gyumri, housing approximately 16 intellectually gifted children between the ages of 3 and 12 today. This is the Russian church. We stood on the stone porch of the great church and watched 18,000 children streaming towards us. This is how it is now in the Armenian earthquake in 88, I think. The towers came down. <coughs> As if it was not enough, 30,000 orphans in Gyumri in 1926, there was an earthquake as well. In the blizzard, there were 9,000 children out there. Orphanage destroyed at the midnight, only a day after 400 children had been removed from the building. The personnel house of the American Relief Workers was so badly damaged that it had to be deserted. A major problem was trachoma, which leads to blindness. And it's very contagious. So many kids sleeping on the same beds, same pillows and stuff, so they had to take care. Trachoma Hospital at Alexanderville with recommendation for 3,000 daily clinic at which each child received individual treatment. This is the Trachoma Hospital. Okay? But at a closer look, look at the children waiting in line. This is part of the 30,000 orphans. You look at the line. I have never seen such a long line of children in one place. Just to get them in line, you need so many people. Here is employee volunteers or employees were obviously, because they served uh, humanity, they returned back to their houses after uh, homes uh, after years uh, on the field. Medals were given. It's a special medal. The Nearest Relief Medal, it's written on it. 
for faith and unselfish service to humanity. And on the back, nearest relief medal includes Islamic Crescent, Persian Lion, Crescent, Persian Lion, Cedars of Lebanon, Christian Cross, but look what's in the middle. In the center, Mount Ararat in memory of the victims of the Armenian Genocide. This year, every year, 2003, Two thousand thirteen, I meant. So Near East Relief and the Armenian Genocide are both ninety-eight years old. Near East Relief became Near East Foundation in nineteen thirty. Thanks to Sean Martirosian, who is the chairman of Near East Foundation today. They are doing relief work in Armenia, Palestine territories, Jordan, Morocco, Lebanon, Sudan, Mali, Egypt. Special thanks. To Rockefeller Ar Archives, where all the new East relief uh, material is. If you have any Near East memorabilia, please be kind to provide digital copies or contact me. Thank you in advance. Thank you very much. <laughs>